Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host Nick Flotto. I had to ramp it up a little bit more in that intro because I just got a DM from our boy, Bellar Magulis, that's a Game of Thrones reference for those who may not know. And he's like, bro, when you introduce yourself and Nick on the pod, it gets me so fired up. I'm ready to run through a wall. So I love that comment. And I'll continue with those those and at those intros. Fire them up, baby. It's a good day for me, Nick. It was a uh, golf day for me, which is always a good day. Played Fox Hollow in Somerville. That is a tough course, man. I think it's the hardest course I've played Ooh, so far in New Jersey. Yeah, no, I had some triple bogeys, unfortunately. At least one, maybe two, maybe three. Shot a 50 on the back. Actually tripled the last two holes and shot a 50 on the back. So I had a nice stretch finally, Nick. It was a five-hole stretch where I had no higher than a five. Some consistency finally. Had myself a par today. Almost had a birdie. Turned that into a bogey. Almost had another par. Turned that into a bogey. But, you know, it was overall a good day. and It was a nice day out. So I can't be complaining. But Fox Hollow, man, that's a tough course for any of those out there listening. I... I'm used to playing on courses like No West, Easy, Flanders. Not that easy, but at the same time, easier than this other place. So, yeah. So, it was tough, Nick. Every time I golf, if I get par, that's, like, nice. You know, I get, yeah. like, one par. If I do 18 and, geez, by, like, the fifth hole, I'm out of it. I'm like, dude, you're this so is out of it. So out of it. You've golfed with me before. And, like, I'll still, like, go out there and I'll have, like, a nice though. shot. I'll you have, like, a nice shot. shot. And you're like, yo, dude, that's great. And I'm just like, oh, my God, but I got to go do this. And it's just like, I don't know. You're not like, interested. A lot. You're not interested in, but golf. I like doing it. You know, like I like going with you and going with. Yeah, my, it was a fun time. And your brother, he plays, but oh, he's yeah. pretty good too. Yeah, you, you, you just can't keep good. focused on golf. You're not into the game, but I understand. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Maybe at some point. Maybe. But anyway, let's we've we've preambled enough. Let's dive into the mail. We got like a lot of questions left to get through. I want to get to as many as we can, and if not, maybe we'll do another one in a, in a week or so and collect some more and get all your questions in. But we start with a good one from Barb loves the G man, and she asks, "Who fits the Giants better?" Rome Odunze, Odunze or Malik Neighbors? So we've hinted at this question for quite a while, Dan, and I have come around to the Roma Odunze camp. I started at the Neighbors camp. I do have a slightly higher grade on Neighbors, and I'm generally the type of person like, well, I have a slightly higher grade on this player, so we should go with that player. But these two players are in the same tier as me. They're very comparable, not from a skill set standpoint, but from a talent and from a what can they offer the New York Giants standpoint. And when you just look at the New York Giants wide receiving core right now, you have a speedster who I think can develop into something a little bit more than that in Jalen Hyatt. You have a shifty, just make him run pivot routes underneath, get the football into his hands. Wandell Robinson, Darius Slayton is like a, a good Z who can fill in as an X as he's had to throughout much of his career with the Giants. And then you have Roma Dunze, who's like six foot three, fluid, a pure X wide receiver who you can align outside who is, I think athletic enough to put in the slot if you want a big slot, but that's not how the Giants will probably use him predominantly. And you start thinking like neighbors is much more akin to a Hyatt and a Wondell Robinson from an explosiveness standpoint. Dunze is explosive for his size, not nearly as explosive as neighbors, but he offers that contested catchability, which is something that the Giants really just do not have right now. So when you really start thinking about it, since these two players are graded comparably in at least my model, I started looking at a Dunze and I'm like, yo, I think he would just be a better overall fit for what the Giants are looking for and for the overall roster construction that they have at the wide receiver position. I don't blame you, Nick. I think on paper, Odunze is the better fit for the roster construction, given everything you broke down. Now, at the same time, I think it's very important to draft the best player if there's a clear best player and not worry about fit and not worry about roster construction. Draft is hard enough. I think what the other day I was in a podcast that was going over edges like these not edges like tweener type edges like that have been drafted recently. There's just so many misses, dude, like Collier, Boogie Basham, like this range of picks. And it's just like it just reminds me. And there. Then they went over Collier like, in the first round. were just, yeah, just so these are reaches. These are reaches. Yeah. Then they went over like even just recent picks like Eric Stokes, like the corner. And then they went to corner and corner. Corner man, corner is the one that is scary for me. I'm I we'll talk about this another pod, but I'm not even that into drafting corners as much anymore. If there's a Deontay Banks at 24, I'm in on it because I love this tape and he to me was a top 15 overall. But like these fringe corners, where you're like pushing up the board because it's like, yeah, we need corners so bad, and I guess he's top 50 because he does have this and this and this. And then these guys just fail. It's like it's such a tough position. I almost kind of want to wait till free agency till these guys are three four years into the NFL and have taken all their lumps already. I don't want the lumps on my team. 
I haven't um I haven't covered the Green Bay Packers, obviously, but I yeah. thought or at least I was under the impression that Eric Stokes was playing really well early in his career. I don't know them, but I, I was under life. but I'm underneath the opposite impression. So somebody you might be right, I might be right. I'm not, not exactly sure. But I, I was under the opposite impression, at least from hearing that podcast. I don't cover the Packers, so I'm not exactly entirely sure. So someone could correct us on but I'm having trouble with that position. But as far as this goes, on paper, Odunze definitely fits the Giants better. Now, you have to make sure you get the best player. Now, you also have to make sure you get the best fit, Nick, from other standpoint, not just from the roster construction standpoint. What do I mean by that? First and most foremost, the personality fit, right? The Giants yeah. are all about this. They want to get receivers who can, you know, fit the smart, tough, dependable, but not just for the fact sense of like fitting this motto that they've created. It's for the sense that this offense is the system is somewhat complicated for these wide receivers. We saw it with Kadarius Tony having trouble with it. Like you can't just have a receiver, any receiver in there and expect the best. So I don't necessarily know that Roma Dunze is a Odunze is a more, I should say advanced receiver yet mentally than neighbors. I don't think it's fair to say that we don't know the information on that, but it's a projection that I can somewhat make from listening to them. Uh, and it just is what it is and watching their routes combinate like what they're running at the college level. And so, you know, I think about that. And then the last thing I think about Nick is the leadership stuff because Romo Dunze was a captain at Washington. I don't know. I don't think neighbors was, and you listen to them both interview and it, it, it does somewhat feel to me like Odunze might be the better fit because what you, what did you say? what did you say? Like maybe two podcasts ago, Nick, you said something about how the giants are ideally looking for one of these wide receivers. If they draft one at six to be the new alpha in the locker Barkley. room, to be the yeah. new Saquon yeah. Barkley, like of the face group. of the team on offense. Sure. Now I don't think that they're not like, Hey, we're drafting this just because we want that. But mm -hmm. Odunze also fills so many practical roles on the football right. field. And it just so happens that he has those leadership qualities that we know Brian Dable and Joe Shane put a high priority on. And, and everything from Washington's program has raved about this kid, everything at the combine. Oh, he stayed after he ran all these, extra, all that stuff. It just, it just kind of points me to, uh, it, it just points me to everything that Joe Shane and Brian Dable have preached since they got here. Smart, tough, dependable, all that yep. kind of stuff. Like Roma Dunze is like the first player in this entire draft that comes to my mind when I start thinking about everything. Like he's played through injuries, all that kind of stuff. You know, this front office right. is going to eat that up. But you said that, but you also said another thing. What you said was not only are you looking for a new Barkley face of the offense type of thing, they're looking for somebody to be the leader of the wide receiver room specifically to the point where you said, and I agree with you, if you find the right guy, the right alpha for that, Wandell could get better through that. Hyatt could get better through that because they're learning from a master technician like a Romo Dunze, for example, someone who I really do feel like runs the routes pretty well and does it, and it could be a good face of that wide receiver room to potentially boost the rest of those guys. So I think that all plays into it too. And that doesn't mean that neighbors doesn't have any of these traits as well. That's what we leave to the giants for them to yeah. decide. They're going to interview all these guys, including neighbors and make that decision based on that. Okay. Nick, Greg asks, well, do you, both of these, yeah, I want to say one thing, both of these yep. wide receivers are going to dictate coverage, right? To yes. some degree. And they could force cloud coverage over the top if they're winning a one-on-one -on -one matchup against a cornerback who is struggling with them. And that in and of itself is going to open up so much for Jalen Hyatt up the seam as a number three in a three-by-one set or Wondell Robinson underneath. And that's something that the Giants just have not had. They tried to get it with Darren Waller from the tight end position, and it didn't really manifest for a variety right. of reasons. So that's what I'm yep. looking forward to as well. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. 
It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. That's why we're happy to have AG1 as our partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. Our mental and physical well-being is of the utmost importance. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all need to take that very seriously. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Big Blue Banter podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New York, New Jersey, Arizona, if you will, or hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash banter to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash banter. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment. And before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, include EE system. Exactly, Nick. Okay, Greg says, Nick, do you guys think uh, we will see more jet motion this year with Wandell Robinson in the backfield? Yeah, I mean, I think they could use him in that manner. Depends on how the defense is playing him. Depends on the game plan. But you keep using that jet motion. You keep showing it, showing it, make the defense account for it pre-snap or just before the snap. And then you hand the football off and catch them off guard as the defense is not adjusting as they did prior when you were just using it for uh, basically a disguise. Right. And I think as with regards to that, it I think the question was asked, Nick, because the, the you know the assumption that because the running back room is different without Barkley, we can see new combinations in the backfield. Possible, but I don't think we're going to see an expansion of Wandell as a running back just because Barkley's gone. I think they'll most likely look to find another back in the draft, but we'll see how that happens. Absolutely. Let's go to the next question, and I believe it is about Joe Milton and Travis, and it's from Matt Steinberg. Yes, Matt Steinberg asks, what's keeping uh, – Travis, the Florida State kid, and Joe Milton, the Tennessee quarterback, out of the same tier as Knicks and Penix prospect-wise. I could just speak for me here, uh, Matt, because this is based on my evaluation. I'll start with Jordan Travis. I know there are some people who are fans of him. I think it might be Emory Hunt. Somebody's a big fan of him that I just saw 
I am not a big fan of Jordan Travis, Nick, and I only know this because I've watched him Keon Coleman because he's somebody who is really tricky to get down. But I think I'm going to end up liking him more than most because of the upside that I see there. But in watching Keon Coleman, I am not impressed with Jordan Travis at all as a quarterback. To me, I don't see almost any kind of upside for an NFL projection. Now, as far as Milton goes, I think it's a different type of prospect than Jordan Travis. He's got size. He's got speed. He's got arm strength. But the issue with Milton right now is he's not like, I don't know how advanced he is playing the quarterback. position. He's almost like a total project in a lot of ways. I think he's going to have to fix his mechanics and retool, potentially even change his entire mechanics. Like this is like now we're in Trey Lance type territory there, but not even really as talented from an arm talent standpoint. So at least from a like yeah. ability to ball placement, like, so it just seems like a big project. I don't think Jordan Travis is a project though. Personally, from what I've seen, I think he's, not maxed out, but I just don't think he's an NFL player. Now, the difference is you're talking about two guys in Nixon Penix who both have played six years of college football. They've mastered their system. They're showing stuff pre-snap. They're po adjusting the things post-snap. They're making, you know, different level reads than these other guys are making who have had less, not these specifically, but any guys who have had less time, Milton included. So I think there's a difference in just the professional way that you see these guys on tape. And as far as Penix goes, I think he's got better arm talent to me than all those. I know Milton has better arm strength, but for what I look for in arm talent, I would say Penix is a clear edge over the rest of those four or three. Good I think that's a good answer, Dan. And now we have Jack. Is it DeMuth or DeMouth, do you think here? I think it's uh, – I just talked to Jack. I think it's DeMuth. Okay. Jack DeMuth asks a couple questions here. You mentioned a few of the wars would be number one in other – classes wide receivers, wide receivers. Yep. Yeah. would be number one in other classes would love to hear you guys rank guys from the last few wide receiver drafts in terms of draft profile i love this i know we've kind of danced around this but now he's specifically laying out players for us so we have zay flowers and jordan okay. addison from last year's draft class drake london chris salave uh devonta smith and jalen waddle and then jamar chase plus the big three from this year would you as the general manager trade six overall in return for both the Vikings first round picks this year and Addison? So we have a couple different questions hmm. there. Well, I don't know which one you want to tackle first, but I like this. Yeah, these are two great questions, Jack. Let's start with the first one here. Um, so he wants us to rank. Does he want us to or he's heard us rank the guys um, in terms of draft profile? What does that necessarily mean? Like how they compare? I think so. Say they were all in the same draft class. Okay. Where would you, Dan Schneier and me, Nick Filato rank? Oh, them? from that standpoint. Okay, I so. I'll I'll say to start, let's just group them all together right now. The big three, Odunze, Neighbors, and and Chase. Or I'm sorry, not Chase, and uh, Harrison. I would definitely take them all three over Flowers and Addison without a doubt for me. London yes. gets interesting because there were – I feel like for me, though, with just to be honest about this, with where I was at with London when he came out of the draft versus where I'm at with him now after watching a lot of his Atlanta tape for CBS sports and for some beyond the box show shows, I now love his NFL tape and love him as a prospect. I didn't necessarily feel as strongly about that when he came out. So I would personally have all three of those over him. Olave as well. Chase, I would have over Waddle. Ooh, that's the interesting one. I would definitely take Harrison over Waddle neighbors and Waddle's an interesting one. I think I, that's tough. I'm going to give a stalemate on that. And then Devontae Smith is a player I like, loved. I think I would – this is tough. Neighbors and Odunze, they're such different players too, Nick. So it's kind of tough. Because um, Devonta Smith has elements of Harrison's game in terms of being just yes. like technically proficient. Yes. It's just you blew on him and he would fall down, or at least that was the perception of him. I think he was maybe a little bit stronger than people gave him credit for, similar to Xavier Worthy this year, right? Like Xavier Worthy is actually pretty strong once he gets the football. And I was watching him against – Alabama this morning because I was doing Kool-Aid McKistry's uh, profile, which should be up on Giants country soon. Good player, by the way. Probably probably a target for the Giants in the second round. And uh, I watched Xavier Worthy like bounce off an Alabama defender. There was Tyrion Arnold, too, who can like hit, right? So like, mm -hmm. but anyways, I just wanted to bring that up. But yeah, if you want to finish what you were saying, and then I can come in as well. I mean, I, for me, Chase is, I think, number one, but then I think it's okay. Harrison. So I think that like, that's where I'm starting from the top. And then I believe it would probably be Waddle and Smith and then neighbors of Dunze. But I, I I'm starting to come around on the Adunze and neighbors, maybe possibly over Smith because I was a little concerned about Smith's size, and I think I was wrong about that. But I'm trying to okay. put myself back in that headspace because I I really love Devonta Smith's game when he came, yeah. was coming out of Alabama. I loved so this is the interesting thing. So I would like 
I love Devontae Smith's game coming out of Alabama. I don't necessarily know if I've loved at least how just the Eagles have used him so far in his career. I just think there's so much more meat on the bone that they're just not doing a good job using him of right now. That's more on them, though. But as far as London, it's like the opposite. I feel like I've seen so much on film from London <laughs> yeah, that I just wasn't ex- wasn't sure I would see against NFL corners. And now I've seen it. So it's easier to say. So for me, Chase is the only definite one for me. Waddle and Smith are the only two that would that would then compete with him. Um, but them, I should say, but the rest of them, man, I, I just have very, have very strong feelings about this. These three receivers. I think they're all really, really high level blue chips. And uh, the funny thing to me, Nick is like, I have the, as far as gut feel goes outside of Harrison, I have a really strong gut feel on Odunze. Like I just see very minimal potential bust factor there. And just like an easy star factor there. Very easy star factor there. Like I think his floor, Odunze's floor, if he stays healthy and everything is still like a really good receiver. You know, yes. he might be right. like, oh, I don't know if he's a top 10 pick, but he's still getting like over a thousand yards and hovering yeah. around, you know, eight, nine touchdowns a year, maybe never being that superstar. That's sure. the floor we're talking about if he doesn't right. get injured. So what's the ceiling? It's freaking right. high. And I've never, I just like, I can't foresee Odunze being any worse uh, from an effectiveness standpoint than Chris Godwin has been in his NFL career. And I personally think that's, he's going to be a, That's a good player. That's a good Godwin. player. That's a great player to have. Yeah. Now, uh, neighbors. I still see the high floor, but there are some scenarios where I, I just have a little bit more red flags for me and neighbors' profile. Not even just like the off field shit for me. It's just like the idea that like so much of this was generated from the slot that I saw when I was watching him. And it just that is great. It's amazing. He's explosive. They probably can't get guarded at the NFL level either, but I would love it if it was outside, more outside production. And it was it would also be nice if he faced press and was able right. to deconstruct press in a manner that we watched like Marvin Harrison Jr. do it and Roma yeah. Dunze when they decided to press him, which was not often. Agreed. Okay. Second question is Would you, as the GM of the Giants, trade six overall for both of Ike's first round picks this year? That means 11 and 23 and Jordan Addison. Yes, of course. Interesting. So you then would you definitely do it for both their first round picks and next year's one? Yeah, I think so. I think I would entertain it. I mean, it depends on how they feel about some of those other wide receivers. But if you're telling me I'm getting two first round picks that I can use on corner edge, possibly a wide receiver, even though you're getting and you're getting Jordan Addison back. Like I wasn't as high on Jordan Addison as a lot of me either. But I like Jordan Addison. I think Jordan Addison is a good player. I don't think he would be as impactful as the two wide receivers who are on the board right now. But all you're telling me is you're getting a slight downgrade from those two. It was still a really talented player. And you get two first round picks and you're just losing a year off of his contract. I'm going to sign up for that. Yeah. I, it's another one of these for me, Nick, at least that looks very amazing on paper. Like on paper, this is an easy yes. And then I deconstructed a little bit and I with you, it's not that I don't like Addison because I liked Addison, but I was not as high on him as others were. And I, and it's, I, so that part of it, I don't love. And then it's like the on paper part for me. Like, so for you, like what you said, you're getting a slightly less bet player at, um, at from 11 to six, right? Yeah. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. If they're going receiver, if they're going to go another position, fine. But like, I, I like A.D. Mitchell. We talked about him. He's going to probably end up being my fourth receiver I bet on, but I don't feel that great about A.D. Mitchell, and I feel nowhere close to how I feel about A.D. Mitchell as I do with Odunze or Neighbors. And as far as Brian Thomas goes, who I was hoping to feel better about, I do not feel that great about him either. And then I'm getting into, like, my thought, which is, like, shit, would I just rather have, like, Pierce or McConkey pretty much than some of these? Like, than Brian Dave, Thomas and A.D. Mitchell? Like, yeah, those two have way more upside, but they also have some more of a floor and just more of just I see some bust potential potentially there. At least I know, you know, I'll get Pierce or McConkey in the slot and I'll be pretty good there as long as they stay yeah. on the field. Um, and those aren't the only guys. Like, even, like, I like some guys. Like, we'll, we'll talk more on receiver pod. But, like, so I don't know. I just... If they're like if Bowers, if you can tell me I can get Bowers at eleven, I'm a little more intrigued by it. But I just feel there is somewhat of a drop off between those three receivers and the Bowers type than when I get to like the AD Mitchells and the Thomases of the world. Yeah, I think if there is a drop off. Yeah, but you're getting two first round picks. You are this, and this Addison, roster needs a lot, and, and you're getting a wide receiver. It's not even just like you're getting the two first round picks. You're yeah. also getting a yeah, wide a receiver who was just drafted in the first round. So, and yes. I think he's a talented player. He's a very different profile than both of those players. But True. the Giants, if they had Jordan Addison on their roster right now. He would be their number one wide receiver. Right. But like, he wouldn't, he would. And I agree with that. But he also, in my opinion, is not someone you can just line up at the X and he's like shifting. No, I, I, I wouldn't. Not, yeah. No, I wouldn't say that. But I think yeah. he's still a, I think he's a, I think he's a really good one B. And that's exactly yeah. what he is in Minnesota. Right. 
So you'd still be looking for your 1A, but I guess right. the question would be, would you trade the idea of the 1A being Robodunze and Malik Neighbors away for getting a really good 1B and two other first-round picks? Or no, one other first pick in Addison, which I guess we're considering a first round, but yeah, which is fine. I'd, I'd rather have the first round, their next year first round than Addison. I know that for sure. The, it's like uh, the mystery bag thing. It's always, nicer. I like the mystery bag thing as yeah. well. Yeah. I do. Like um, okay. Let's see. EJ Heard asks, Hey, Dan and Nick, hopefully I'm not too late for the mailbag. I've been thinking of this one for a while. Say you were to have sim two similarly graded prospects at a Saint at, at a position. One has elite physical traits with decent film. And one has a late film, elite film and production on the field and stats, but is less physically impressive. Which do you guys opt for and why? I usually opt for the upside, but I think a lot of this depends on what else the Giants have on their roster, how much you trust their coaches to develop when they do develop, and um, who the individuals are, which is unfortunately something Dan and I can't really assess. But uh, it also depends on the position, too. Some positions I want, like, just a really technically sound interior defensive lineman who is just going to, you know, play those two downs and who's just going to stop rather than somebody who flashes this upside of quickness and burst and flexibility, but is like Demontre Moore, right? Like somebody who lets you down. That was more a little off field, I think, but like just doesn't exactly know what they're doing when they're on the gridiron. So I really think it does depend on positions. And we can go through position groups and name that. Wide receiver is one of those ones where it does get interesting. So I just said Malik Neighbors, but I think a lot of the times you do want that like explosive guy and that guy maybe you can develop. But in the giant situation right now, I don't think they're in that position. I think they're in a position to go with a, a guy like Romo Dunze, like we just discussed. Other teams might be more willing to bet on a guy that they can develop and hopefully they hit like a Tyreek Hill or something. Yeah, it's interesting as you go by. I think for me, it comes down to, so like, for example, you said physical, uh, these elite physical traits with decent film, or one has elite film and production. So that's the thing. It's if the film is translatable, it means a lot more to me than if the film I don't find to be translatable. And what do I mean by that? Like, okay, if I'm watching a interior prospect on either side of the ball, center or D tackle, you know, older prospect, bigger than the players he's playing against beat up on his shit, his conference, even if it's not a shitty conference, even if it's a good conference, but he also like beats up and collects all these stats and sacks or, you know, great pancake blocks and great, uh, you know, PFF game grades. If he's on the offensive line against like the, the first three games to Kent state, you know, Appalachian state, you know, shit fill, whatever the hell it is. Like, I'm not trying to discredit these, co these colleges, they're great schools, but they're none of them are matching up in the NFL and they're all too small. It's not a real projection of what's going to come. For me, it comes a lot down to projection, which is hard to do, and that's what makes this whole process so difficult. But I'm just trying my best to see the traits that they have on tape. So it does matter about the tape. In addition to the traits that they have, like you're talking about in this question, EJ, which is the physical traits as far as the athletic testing goes. It's a combination of those two. The football traits you see on the film, on the uh, you know, on the on the field, on the film with those athletic traits, and then translate it to what it's going to look like against a 270 pound edge rusher who can run a four three or something like that. You know, it's to me that's at least how I do it because I do see a lot of fake production, I do see a lot of fake stats, I do see a lot of stuff to me that doesn't end up translating, and that's the reality because if it wasn't the case, we would see so many of these good stat good production guys better in the nfl like why isn't boogie basham good in the nfl that's a great example of a player whose just projection didn't work for him he just did not project at all to the nfl game clyde edwards alaire looked very good his last year at lsu his production his film did not translate to the nfl at all so there it does come down a lot to me to projection uncle jesse asks pick an app mozzi sticks or bow buns also, is it crazy to think Daniel Jones won't play a single snap all year, bearing in mind the injury guarantee? Lock, quarterback one, plus let May, JD, hold the clipboard for a year. One can dream, am I right? Hashtag big blue banter. Thank you so much, Uncle Jesse. So start with the food take, Dan. Where are you going there? Uh, well, if it's a good – so here's the deal. If we're talking about a good Italian restaurant, so for example, there's a good one in Denville that both Nick and I have got. Yeah, Olive Garden, right? Yeah. Yeah, Olive Garden. It's called Pasta Shop. And we've talked about it on the pod. It's good. Yeah, we ordered their mod sticks. It's everybody who I talked to who loves this place told me to order them. They're fucking fantastic. They're homemade mozzarella sticks. Thick breading, Parmesan cheese baked onto it. Like really good stuff. Great mod cheese in there. That's great. But some pizza places you order from, let's be honest about the situation. They're giving you the frozen mozzarella sticks out of the bag in from the freezer into the deep fryer. They're that same kind of like smaller cigar shape. You know the frozen ones when you get them. Those just look down, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those not good. 
I will take bow buns over those every day. You want to know why I'll take a bow bun over those every day? I know a bow bun is always going to be homemade. Okay. I know a bow bun is not going to be some frozen crap that's handed to me out of a deep fryer. So mm -hmm. it really just depends. I'll take a great Moz stick over a bow bun, but it's got to be homemade. What about you? I think you absolutely killed that analysis. There we go. In a great way. Good job. So the second part of the question, do you think it's crazy that DJ won't play a single snap all year because of the injury guarantee? It's an interesting question. And it's one that just we've discussed at times on this pod this offseason, Nick, the last two or three months. But the Giants haven't addressed this at all yet in any way, shape, or form. At least not to my knowledge. I don't think I saw Joe Shane answer this question in any of his pressers, Nick. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I saw Joe Shane answer or be asked this when he talked with John Schmelk and Madeline Burke in that uh, interview for the Giants huddle. Uh, so Brian Dable, I don't think, has answered this question or been asked this question. So it's really interesting to me the Giants haven't addressed it because it's a serious question, right? And the idea here is, for those who don't know, if you haven't followed along, Daniel Jones has an injury guarantee in his contract. And if Daniel Jones does play next year, like the Giants start Daniel Jones for week one and he's just playing for a few weeks and now he's playing as the starter. If he gets a season ending injury and cannot pass his physical by next March, the Giants are now on the hook for an injury guarantee of, I think, 25 million against the cap, cannot move that money dead on your cap. Then obviously at that point, the Giants after his third season ending injury would cut him. They're not going to be like, oh yeah, let's pay $50 million a year to this guy. So now they're cutting him. That's going to take another 23 million in dead cap. And now you've got almost a $50 million cap hit for Daniel Jones in 2025. And he won't be on your roster. You can't win football games with that, right? There's just no way you can allocate 18 to 19% of your total salary cap space to a player that's not even on your roster and expect to be a team that wins anything that year. So it's a serious question that I would hope they're debating internally. And I could imagine they'd have to be debating internally, but I'm not so sure about that, Nick, right? Like we haven't heard anything from the giant. Maybe they wouldn't say it, Nick, but we really haven't heard anything from the giants. They wouldn't like, say it. Yeah, no, of oh, course yeah. they wouldn't say it. So when would we find out then something like this in your mind? If this were to Week be one, case? maybe if that okay. were to be a thing, I don't I don't think this would happen. I don't think it's the craziest idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. But Dan, have you ever seen the movie Platoon? No, it's a I Vietnam haven't. War yeah, movie with yeah, William Defoe and Thomas Berenger, right? Yeah. Uh, at the end of the movie, there's a character who looks around and he's not wounded and then he takes a knife and he stabs himself in the leg to get off the front line. <laughs> That's what Daniel Jones should do, man. Be like, just look around and be like, yo, 25 million guaranteed. Okay. <laughs> I got to get it. <laughs> yeah. I can't pass this physical. And that's it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but it, look, I agree with you it, with what you said. We probably wouldn't find out to week one. And, and what you also said there, Nick, which is I don't think it's going to happen. I also don't think it's going to happen. But why? We still haven't answered why neither of us, like I know in our gut, we don't think it's going to happen. They're just going to play him, right? He's just going to be the starter for week one, mm -hmm. as they've said, because they probably won't be able to draft anyone. And even if they are trade up or draft, I don't think that person they'll think is ready for week one. And then maybe they do play lock, but I don't know. Like I get the feeling just like you, that they'll play Daniel Jones. And then that question is just goes unanswered and it's just, okay, cross your fingers. Hope he doesn't have his third season and an injury in six years. Cause if he does now you've allocated 50 million of your 2025 cap space to this guy. It's a dangerous game they're playing. It is, man. It is a very man. dangerous game. It really is. PL73 asks, Renan said in his most recent podcast that if the Giants had their choice of Daniels, May, and McCarthy, his gut reaction would be that they would go with Daniels of those three. Do you think from a scheme and upside standpoint, this makes sense? And if they were able to land a trade up? That's a good question. I think from a scheme standpoint, we discussed the thing on the last show. I do really like the fit for Jaden Daniels and Brian Dable's seam. And I say that just because I just watched Tyrod Taylor in this scheme, and I do see similarities between those, between those two quarterbacks. And I think that Tyrod allowed Dable to do things. I don't think this. I know this. I'm not going to even go into how I know this, but I know that Tyrod T Taylor allowed Dable to open up different parts of the Giants' playbook and his system that weren't available to him with the other quarterbacks that were playing this year. So you can read into that what you will, but the offense was different. It was called different. It was operated different. And I think Daniels would allow him to also – because Daniels maybe doesn't have as good an arm downfield as Jones. I think that could be debatable. I would take Daniels' arm, but I think if they're both touch throwers downfield, I think I'd just slightly give the edge to Daniels, specifically touch in the red zone and ball placement in the red zone for sure, and ball placement on the vertical plane. I find that game to be a little bit overrated. I agree. Anyway, I agree with Jones that. Yeah. I think it goes um, to Daniels slightly. Slightly, though. Not oh, no, no. I went, I yeah. went the other way. I went. It goes to Daniels. That's what I said, Daniel. Oh, okay. I thought you said Daniel. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's tricky yeah. with Daniels versus Daniel. Yeah. So I think there would be a fit in the offense. 
I just don't necessarily. I'm 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 sorry. I'm just not necessarily sure, Nick, that I see the upside argument that that PL's talking about or or that there supposedly is with Daniels. To me, the upside by far is is Drake May of these three, and it doesn't matter what system he's in, doesn't matter what offense he's in. There's only one guy to me that that has NFL level upside, real big upside out of those three. And I and I know it seems, and I, I'm 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 coming around to this, and I know it seems to crazy to say because Daniels should have upside in the NFL given the stats he put up at the college level in the SEC. And maybe I'm going to be wrong about this, but I just have question marks about how that game translates fully to the NFL. And you got to look at the process too. When you we we, we went over this on the Jane Daniels podcast, right? Look at the process, and you see there are a lot of red flags. So if he ends up being a superstar, you could be like, well, there were those red flags, and he addressed those red flags, and he excelled yeah, and propelled right. himself over those red flags. So I'm completely happy with him, and we still see a path for success with Jane Daniels. But if you want to listen back to that podcast, you'll see that there are some advanced analytics and things that pop up on his tape that are on his profile that to illustrate a red flag. I like Jane Daniels and I would not hate that pick, but I also Either. acknowledge that, Hey, we need to see a little bit more over the middle of the field. Was that just a Brian Kelly LSU thing? It might, might be right. But those are instances on tape where we're not seeing pure comfortability throwing over the middle field. Like, let's be honest. Like we see with Drake may, right? Drake may, there's a lot wrong with this profile. We're about to do a, we're, we're about to, or we're, we already did, depending on when this podcast drops, mm -hmm. our, uh, our piece on, on Drake may, and there's a lot to be concerned about, but just some of the throws he makes over the middle of the field, there's what, like five or six quarterbacks who, who attempt those kind of throws who right. see what, where that wide receiver is going to be at a specific and it, and moment. And it's simply not on Jaden's film. That's the problem. Exactly. It's just not it's three or four times versus 30. And that and doesn't just, account for the, all the other stuff we talked about, the, the slight frame, the, the thin sure. shoulders and the propensity to run into brick walls. Like all of those things are concerned. Yeah. And the concerning ability of how many scrambles he had. Remember, over a hundred more scrambles than Dorian Thompson Robinson. That's just that's not gonna cut in the NFL. You can't just put your head down and scramble all the time. It's just not gonna work. Uh, but there still is upside to him. So it's like if he do, I, if he falls to six and the Giants take him, I'll convince myself. I'll get really excited fast because again, I see it's not I don't schematically. This could be the thing is this. I'll say this about Jane and Daniels, Nick, and I'm curious to get your take on this. Caleb it's Williams, Washington, though, I think probably. But Caleb yeah. Williams off the board. We don't even have a chance at him. Okay. Out of the guys left, I think Jaden Daniels could play the fastest for the Giants because of that potential schematic fit. I think he could be starting. I mean, like starting the fastest for the Giants. Like no, Drake no. May may need some time. JJ, I get it. He played a pro style, but I personally think he might need some time. And I'm not sure he could start and be effective right away. Jaden, I think, could come in and give them the baseline of what Tyrod gave them. Maybe, but Tyrod also processed things faster. He's a veteran. He's seen defenses for 12 freaking years. It's part of why you guys watch Tyrod and he was doing those three, five step drops and just ripping those balls over the top. It's not necessarily going to happen for sure for Penix and, and you know, Jaden Daniels types, just because we saw it on their college tape. Yeah, absolutely. we got a question here from Jorge curious, Jorge 10. He asks if Waller retires, where do you rank tight end as a need? It's not high for me. Um, I get it why some people might view it as high, but I, again, I just, I think about the tape and I'm not saying he's like a superstar player, but from the tape standpoint, Daniel Bellinger is a starting tight end. Okay. He's a good blocker. He can be used in multiple a variety of roles. He's been used as an H back, as a fullback, as an inline tight end. I've seen him in the slot. I've seen him open on the vertical plane. Ball doesn't come his way. I've seen him open for those kind of intermediate hole shots. Sometimes the ball came his way. DeVito hit him on one or two of those. So I think he kind of can do everything. And then I think back to hasn't really dropped that many passes in his career. Catches pretty much everything that comes his way. Tough after the catch. We'll take hits and we'll be able to make catches and fight through contact at the at the contact. Or I'm sorry, fight make catch at the contact point, depending on how hard, you know, who's making that play on him. Also, I think in his case, it hasn't really, we haven't, I don't think this part we've seen as much yet, Nick. And maybe it's just been an opportunity thing. But he did test out at the combine as one of the better athletes. His RAS score was in the high nines. So there is, in my mind, still some potential upside for after the catch. Haven't seen it fully yet. I get that. But we haven't seen much passing or offense in general during his career with the Giants. Like the Daniel Jones throws for, what, 2,000, 3,000 yards a year. We're not getting that many passing yards anyway from this offense. So I still think there's a little bit of upside there, too. And then the other two guys behind him, I think, can play a role of in line on the line of scrimmage, moved around and just kind of really into tough physical players at the contact point, which it's, I, I just I guess I don't really see tight ends a position, Nick, that every team has a great one of. And I don't personally need it. So Daniel Bellinger has more career catches 
than both Manhurts, who was like an eight or nine year pro, and Jack Stoll. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Neither are on the roster next year. Neither is Lawrence yeah. Cager. Daniel Bellinger is the only player at the tight end position who's going to be on the roster next year if Darren Waller retires and if, really if, he, if Darren Waller doesn't retire. So I yeah. think tight end is a need. I think having a good 12 personnel package is one of the reasons sure. why I was very excited about Darren Waller coming over. It just didn't really matter because there were so many issues with the offense. I still think having a very competent and even explosive 12 personnel package where both tight ends can block adequately, that can really help your offense. So I don't Great. think at the top, I don't think at the top three need, but I could be entertained in four. Like quarterback, wide receiver, cornerback. Even if we eliminate quarterbacks, that's so like kind of a um, specific, right? Yeah. So co- cornerback. I mean, you could argue, say there really, what isn't a need on the giants right now? Everything is basically a need except for edge. And even then I can make a, I think a very depth, coherent depth, argument that yeah. edge that you could use an edge rusher to, right. to help because you're relying a lot on Aziz. Who's behind Aziz Ojolari? Nothing. We don't have much. Boogie Basham. Yeah. Like, so yeah, I, I, I mean, you can make the argument that maybe Isaiah Simmons will play that role. And I'm actually a little bit excited about that, but I'm not hundred percent certain if that's going to be his role. He might just be a, a uh, sub package linebacker where I think he could also thrive. Right. But uh, I think tight end, you can easily say it's a top five need if you want to, if Waller does retire, that's no slight on Daniel Bellinger. I think Daniel Bellinger can and is a starting tight end in the national football league. I just think having more tight ends yeah. for the future can definitely help what the giants are trying to do from a personnel standpoint. And also you're relying on man hurts and Stoll. I like both of those players, but they're both on the contract for one year. Um, I, I agree with, I'm, I'm fine with that perspective, Nick. And I like that perspective, the more long-term thingy perspective, but I think as far as like short-term goes, we can yeah. get through personally. I, I think we'd be able to get through if Waller retired and, for and this I think season, a lot yeah. of that. Yeah. We, for this, it'd be better than last year. It'd be, be better than last Already year. Better than which, which is crazy. Right. Cause yeah. Darren Waller was in that room. And I, mean, I don't think tight end rooms around the NFL are as good as people think they are. I think it's a lot of a grass is always greener. I find a lot of tight ends to be overrated. I just think the position is very hard to play in the NFL. It's my, what I've decided, you know, obviously quarterback, I put one, but I think tight end is probably one of the hardest positions. The only position where you have to block and catch really. And, and you have to play at the line of scrimmage and win there right. in the trenches while also somehow getting open and making plays as well on the football. Um, I can tell you this because I was given some inside info that I'm allowed to share um, from from Frank Bellinger, Daniel's dad, who might be listening to this. Daniel's been training heavily in the offseason with breakout tight end last year, Sam Laporta. And one thing that Daniel's been working on is adding strength to his game, wants to try to mold himself in the Mark Bavaro mold moving forward. That's the type of tight end he wants to be. So, Could you get stronger than Daniel Bellinger when he showed up at training camp last year? <laughs> yeah, time? with that picture oh, they I took him. That's yeah. crazy. Looks so jacked in that picture. I think nah, he talked yeah. about that on the show we had him on, so that was funny. Yeah, Bellinger's All right. Bellinger's done. Giants fan the can who has a Twitter name as P. Combs. One, given the recent news, he might want to change. I can tell him from experience if you have a name similar to a, I don't know if he's been confirmed yet, Puff Daddy, but probable, you know predator in some way for <laughs> he's a definite predator i don't know what kind of predator yet but if you have a name similar to a predator type of human being you're going to want to change that name or in my case you can't change the name so you're just going to want to try to avoid it but i, I your can case, only imagine why you're bringing this up is it personal or something it's personal <laughs> it's personal and p.combs combs asks who do you all think the giants will look to target in round one and what is the probability of quarterback going the first three picks I think the probability is high that quarterbacks can go with the first three picks, whether that's a trade or just the Patriots sitting there. So if that were to happen, then the Giants will have their pickings of whichever wide receiver ends up falling to them. That's even if saying the next two teams take wide receiver, which might not happen as well. And who do I think the Giants will target in the first? I think it's going to be one of those wide receivers. So I think it could be Marvin Harrison too. Like I, there's there's realistic scenarios where Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to the Giants. It's uh, dude, think about it. Like we we would have said the same thing before the anti Kayvon Thibodeau rhetoric started popping up in the pre-draft process. If you told Giants fans that they would get Kayvon Thibodeau at five in the beginning of that pre-draft process, you would have thought it was crazy. Crazier stuff happens in the NFL. It Trayvon does. Walker went one overall that year. Yeah. Yeah, you just can't try to predict this. You can't. You can try to predict this a draft, but you can't sit there and say, "I know what's going to happen in a draft." Yeah. Nobody knows what's going to happen in a draft. That's the whole point of what makes the draft so fun. So I agree with you on that, Nick. As far as who do you all think the Giants are targeting in round one? I think it could be quarterback too. Yeah, I think it's a quarterback as far as just pure target goes. Um, 
the probability of the quarterback going the first three picks, I'm putting it at 99.999% to infinity. I think it's going to go quarterback one, quarterback two, quarterback three, either to the Patriots or they will trade that pick to the Giants where the Giants will take a quarterback. That's my prediction right now. Um, and I think trade up the three is very much in play for the Giants if the Patriots don't like who's left at three and if the Giants love who's left at three at the quarterbacks. It's all dependent on Realistically, that. what are we giving up for that? Because that is a realistic a scenario. Yeah. yeah. So we're giving up two. And uh-huh. then one next year, and then what? Two next year, maybe? No, or no, no. Three? It can't be that much. It can't be that much because the Jets gave up three twos for the six to yeah. three move, and maybe the leverage is higher on the Patriots side. But hopefully, Joe Shane's good enough at this now that he can call their bluff on it because Patriots are not going to. But it's going to take more to than leverage. like there could be plenty of teams willing to trade. So it really just depends on if the Patriots want to drop all the way back to eleven, That's my point. If it's yeah. the Vikings or or wh- whatever the situation is. Like dropping back to six, they can still get right. Rune, they right. can still get Malik neighbors. So that's going to be the argument. All the bluff if you're Joe Shane, because you know that any team trading back is not going to want to move out of the Patriots especially have made it very clear. I've listened to a lot of their interviews because I'm trying to figure out if they're going quarterback earlier this offseason when I was trying to hope the Giants would trade up for May or whatever. They're either going quarterback or receiver. They're in the exact same boat as the Giants. From what I've heard, they want an alpha receiver. They have no receiver talent on that depth chart. I think they wouldn't want to miss on one of those three if they trade back. So I think it, they, they would lean to the Giants. It doesn't necessarily mean that I think the Giants will get the best deal, though. I think they could still get burned there, potentially. Okay, Michael Berzer- Berserk says, or Bersick says, I know we don't draft for position, but what position and pick would you hate at six? Good Ooh. question. Uh, linebacker. <laughs> yeah, no. So a realistic position that I and think pick. and pick, I think edge, right? Like that's not yeah. going to happen, but they yeah, did bring good. in, they, they bring, they did bring in Dallas Turner, right? Like they did bring in some of these top edge rushers. It's very much not going to happen. 0.1% possibility that somehow they do do that. Yeah. We would hate that pick after trading for Brian Burns. Yeah, well, the Jets did it last year, and Jets fans were not happy when they drafted a 24-year-old edge. Yeah, it's but like Will happy. McDonald, that was in, like, pick, like, what? That was late. No, no, it was the mid- middle first round, I think. Yeah, it, looks, right. yeah, it wasn't pick six. No, no, it wasn't pick six. But just point being, when you stacked at one position and you go into a draft, like, oh, fans are like, yeah, yeah we won't go this position. It's like, wait a second, what? And they're like, no, you don't, don't worry about drafting into the strength of the like, Or don't worry about how many positions. You can never have too many edge runs, like that type of thing. And I think that would, in your scenario, Nick, piss off some fans. Probably piss me off too. I think for me, the answer to that question is obviously there's no running backs in this class that we can take. Thank yeah. God. So we won't get that. No linebackers. For me, the answer would be Michael Penix at six. I do not see... Uh, any kind of long-term top five or top 10 ceiling for him, unless he's morphs into Philip Rivers. I just think I remember Philip Rivers at NC State. I remember him well, and he was much better in my mind at NC State than Penix was at Washington. Now you can come back to me and say, no, 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 look at the stats. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not using stats, total raw stats as a barometer for who I think was better in college. Philip Rivers was phenomenal at the collegiate level, carrying NC State in a lot of ways and just making plays to me from a tra- that from a projection standpoint that translates to the NFL a lot more than Penix's did. And I think Penix has the upside of having a high floor player like Penix, if he hits a ceiling to me, could get you potentially what cousins has been able to give you at the NFL level as an ultimate, like top, top ceiling. But to me at six, that would be a horrible pick to make. And that doesn't even touch on that. I don't like spending the six overall pick on a player with two shoulder surgeries and two ACLs. Renee says, we all agree. Shane's process is good, but if this draft doesn't produce talent, do you have to move on due to lack of ability to hit on NFL caliber players? But when are we going to know that this draft didn't produce talent? Yeah. That's like me, a real question. Years. Yeah, it takes like three years. So even at that point, we can't even judge Joe Shane's first draft. Right. And think about last year. We were all ready to you know, ship Micah McFadden out of town. He ended up balling out, right? Like we're hoping that right. same thing happens with Dane Belton. So there are picks from his first draft that are hitting. I just think... Maybe it's fair to say, I don't even know if it's fair to say that we want, we expect more from Kayvon Tibbet. It's probably fair to say, right? But he's had over 40 pressures in each of his seasons. I think we want a little bit more from him. And then Evan Neal has been a bust so far through two years. So that's, I guess, where all of the, the gripes come from. But Wanda Robinson tore his ACL, but everything we've seen from him when he's healthy, he's a talented football player that Dable is using really well. So I still think we got to be really patient. Yeah, I just think generally what Nick said is right. We just need more time to evaluate draft class. And I'll say this. I'm going to have to find this just like I missed the last stat and I haven't looked it up yet. But I think somebody in the comments helped me out and told me where I found the stat. But I also heard a recent stat of a study done that shows this massive jump at the NFL with offensive linemen from year two to year three. There's just a big learning curve now at the NFL from a 
from a um, you know a trend standpoint as far as offensive linemen. And this is a good news potentially for Evan Neal. I'll find this. This is what I think I believe I heard this on the PFF podcast. I'll find this and I'll bring it back. But it's a good news for Evan Neal potentially, and I think we need to give him a little more time because of it. But you know, there's just it's tough. These guys are are making a big jump in the level of play and the speed of play. It's not something that always translates one-to-one. Like you were amazing at college. Now you're amazing at the NFL. Just need to give it a little bit more time, but it's a fair question, Renee. We can't just keep saying the process is great. Oh, the results suck. The process is great. Oh, the results aren't that good. Oh, the process is great. We only care about that. Some point the results have to start matching up to the process. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see what we got here. Pulling it up. And we have Henry white asks, I know the giants already spend more, than other teams at offensive line. But am I crazy in thinking if the Giants don't come out of this draft with an interior offensive lineman who can compete to start at guard that they're in trouble? Um, I don't think you're crazy to think that, Henry, but I don't think that's what I think because, A, I don't personally believe, again, that rookie offensive linemen are making these huge jumps and just immediate impact players. That happens sometimes. Trey Smith in Kansas City, now even though it was sixth round, he was immediate producer. He's not the only one. But there's also some struggles out the gate from some of these guards. The kid that Houston draft, I know he was injured, but a lot of people thought that was a plug-and-play guy, the kid from A&M uh, two years ago, and he has not been that good yet, and I know he got hurt. And there's plenty examples of interior offensive linemen that I've seen drafted over the last five, six, seven, ten draft classes that just aren't ready yet. Again, this, like I just said, offensive linemen are taking longer and longer to transition to the NFL. So no, as far as the short term, I say no to your answer, but – Long term, I can understand why you would want a young guard to potentially be their building block piece there. So, yes. So the Giants usually carry or NFL usually carries like eight, nine offensive linemen, right? Yeah. Andrew mm-hmm. Thomas, John Runyon, Jermaine Illuminor, Aaron Stinney, John Michael Schmitz, Joshua Zudu, Evan Neal. And then that's where you're at seven. So if they were to draft a interior offensive lineman, there's there's a spot for that player to take a roster spot from an Austin Schlotman or a Marcus McKeithen, right? I think Schlotman, right. they probably want on the team. Remember last year, they wanted Hassenauer there. Hassenauer ended up getting hurt. Yep. And then John Michael Schmitz didn't really have a true center to back him up. So I think Schlotman, more than likely, they probably want him to seize that backup center, center role. But there is a spot for an interior offensive lineman. They just had Cooper Beebe, the Kansas State kid. And I don't know if you've seen film on him yet, dude. He's, He's very fun to watch. He's like a Bowser out there. You know what I'm saying? I think he has a little Will Hernandez in him. I think he's a little bit more fluid than Will Hernandez. More fluid, but just a little boxy. But I don't know if that's. I mean, he just has that's like his build, though. It's not really his movement. He might just, he doesn't move as boxy, but he does have a boxy build. Like Troy Fountain, now the the Washington tackle, he's boxy, but he doesn't move like it. But he he does not move boxy. Good point. He doesn't move boxy. He doesn't got that boxy move. No, but I I know exactly what you're saying. All right. Almighty Giants asks to assist. With long-term roster construction, which positions will see their current salary cap percentage change, either greater or smaller percentage of team cap over the next five years? How are the Giants preparing for this? Well, I can tell you one thing. The only position that's gone down over the last five years has been running back, the only entire position in the NFL, and that's just the state of the in the market. And the Giants have already adjusted that. They didn't pay their running back this offseason. Safety, I think, is another position that could go down, come back down or stabilize and level out. I think the explosion positions are going to be receiver, continue to get out of control, quarterback, continue to get out of control, edge, continue to get out of control, and tackle, continue to get out of control. There's another so, one, too. What? What'd you say? Interior defensive lineman. Yeah, interior defense linemen are getting paid more than they used it's to. It's already but... it's already happening, man. The the priority yeah. for defenses to right. create interior pressure while also allowing the back end of their defense to play too high coverages True. is very important. Like the Giants are one of the teams that have that special play. Like Dexter Lawrence is such a special player for his impact that he provides his defensive coordinator because his defensive coordinator is not forced to play middle of the field closed all the time and then roll a safety down into the box. You could play too high so much more because Dexter Lawrence is so talented. He can gap in a half. Having those types of players, Jeffrey Simmons is another one. There's, there's a bunch around the NFL, but not as many as you would think. And I think a lot of teams are looking for that specific player. Giants have it in Dexter Lawrence. So I think interior defensive linemen, those types of interior defensive linemen that allow a defense to do that, they're going to start getting paid a lot. And I think the Giants got ahead of it by paying Dexter Lawrence. Now we see Christian Wilkins, who's not as good as Dexter Lawrence, getting as much money as he got. And a right. lot of other interior defensive linemen were getting paid. 
Good point, especially without the defensive change. And we're going to see it with the Giants this year. They're going to lot the rely on what Dexter Lawrence can do for them and how that impacts the whole scheme. So it's another good one. And the way to get ahead of it um, and how the Giants can prepare for it is by using their high draft capital on those positions that are going to explode because that's one way to game the system, as Joe Shane has said. And don't use those picks on safeties and running backs. Um, that's one way to not game the system and go the opposite route. So I think they'll continue to use the heavy capital there um, to try to get those positions. Almighty Giants also ask, do you believe in this draft, Nick and Dan, the Giants will go heavy offense? Well, I don't think they'll go heavy offense per se. I think they're going to go offense with their first pick. I could see, you know, them going about half their picks offense, but I think they're not going to ignore the defense. I think there are holes on the defensive side. Yeah. I think you got to look at the secondary specifically, whether that be safety or cornerback. I think looking at the interior defensive line is another move that they might pull. They might want some edge depth. You could use some linebacker depth. Like the, the team has some holes on the on the defense. So I don't think they're just going to go purely offensive heavy. I think they're just going to draft the players that align with their needs and who are also highly regarded on their board. And if that happens to be more offense, then yes. But I do think that first pick will be offense because I don't even know who's going to be the first defender taken off. Is it going to be Atlanta because they don't have any edge rushers? Maybe people but assume that, but it's yeah. very hot. This, this draft has a lot of talent on the offensive side. And then like that offensive tackle and wide receiver position. And some of the other positions are a little bit lacking, especially on the defensive side. The I heard one line. draft analyst of a film guy struggled to, I haven't heard of him, but I thought he was good content. And I listened to him on podcast, Nick, he struggled. He, they, the coast asked him how many impact, true impact players do you even see in this class on the defense side of the ball? He struggled with naming more than three that he finds to be true impact players potential at the NFL level. And he got to four, but it's just not a great sign for defensive class. Even the guys at the top, even if those three or four were like, there was like a, you know, even a cave on Thibodeau and Aiden Hutchinson, I don't even know if I see any of those in this class. Like I like the kid from uh, Toledo, but I watch him and I'm not, it's not like I was watching Patrick Sertan or that level for me. Oh, I think Patrick Sertan is just like, he's the peak of a, of a cornerback prospect coming out. And I think we, we but just came up at him at what pick nine. Yeah, that was yeah. a crazy draft, though. Micah Parsons, right. when, you know what I mean? Right. The Giants were right in that area. Another too. guy. I don't know if I see like a Micah Parsons in this class either. I'm, I'm just struggling. Like Dallas Turner is the closest thing I see to it, but I don't know. No. So I agree with your entire answer, Nick. The only thing I would add to that is this. The Giants on paper have a just god awful looking offense going into this year. If we're going to be blank and if we're going to be frank about this and blunt about this and take off our blue color glasses and pretend this isn't a giant podcast for a second, their current offensive depth chart is Daniel Jones, Drew Locke, Tommy DeVito at quarterback, Devin Singletary, Eric Gray, Gary Brightwell at running back, and who they just signed, then Jalen Hyatt, Wandale Robinson, Darius Slayton, Hodgins at receiver, then Bellinger. So, uh, you know, the two, the two blocking tight ends at tight end, and then a great left tackle and somewhat question marks across the board. Besides, maybe you can pencil and run in, but it's not even a lock. John Michael Schmitz, again, we are hoping for, but it's not even a lock. It's like on paper, that offense is, I can't imagine there's too many offenses on paper that look worse than that or sound worse than that. So they kind of do have to lean a little more heavy on the offense. So the way I look at this is. I think wide receiver at six, say. I think they could draft a developmental yeah. quarterback or something more than a developmental quarterback, maybe the future heir to Daniel Jones, right? I don't, I mean, they could go offensive line, right? But I think cornerbacks are going to be available to them at the second yeah. and the third. And I think that's another position where the talent is going to align with where they're picking. And I don't know if they're going to want to throw Shane Bowen to the Wolves and be like, hey, True. it's going to be Cordell Flott and Nick McLeod behind Deontay Banks. And maybe you'll get something out of Aaron Robinson. And then at safety, you're going to go with Dane Belton and Jason Penn. I right. just, I could see it maybe being like four picks offense, two picks on defense, but one of those picks sure. being like the second, maybe even the third round pick. I, I can, I can actually realistically see that, but uh, I just think there are needs on the other side of the football as well. I know the offense doesn't look great, but there are certainly needs on the other side of the football too. I agree. Okay. Almighty giants also asked Braylon Allen around what pick are you like? Let's get this guy. I mean, this is a question for you. You're the, you're the bad. You can answer it too. I mean, I, Braylon? I've only, I've watched big 10 football and I mm. probably like him a little bit better than you. But doesn't this guy have like insane tread on his tires at this part, or just like, he's just well, has a lot of wear and tear. Well, that's the weird. But he's also young, about. isn't he? Yeah. He, yeah. he played at 18 as a true freshman at Wisconsin. That's pretty and was crazy. physically dominating everyone that he was on the field against. He's only 20 years old now. So he has tread, 
but he also split with Garanendo, the guy from uh, the guy who is now on Louisville. He was at Wisconsin two years ago. They split touches. So it's not like a, I know treads, not really my issue with him. As far as if I want to answer this question, when do I say, let's get this guy for me? I don't think I ever get to a, let's get this guy point. This is not going to be one of my guys. Um, I would take him maybe if he's sitting around in round five or four at that point, but I, it would even be close round four. I'm okay with it. It's not a, let's get this guy round five. I'm closer to let's get this guy, but he's just not really a, let's get this guy for me. I think he has good footwork. doesn't really have long speed. In my opinion, I'm not so sure he plays to his size and has next to no, like just production or reps. What'd he's not say? like a, he's like a more of like a, he's a big 10 running back, right? Like he's not like a wiggle kind of guy. Not much of a wiggle kind of guy, but has more wiggle. I think he's got more wiggle than his size would suggest. He's like, you know, he's like 6'2", 240 or something like that. Yeah, so man. Like 235. But also just doesn't have a lot of reps or projection or, you know, or production, which may impact his projection, running zone. So it's just been a lot of power gap. And yet I don't really see him as power gap in the NFL because I don't think he's like, he's not really fast enough and he doesn't play strong enough and he doesn't play with low enough pad level. So, I don't really know where his fit is. He's not a let's get this guy for me, though. All right. A question from AV asks, do you want or think the Giants should target a corner that projects inside or just take best available cornerback? Personally, the thought of home starting in nickel worries me more than the depth outside. So I think this extra from Chris Garrard and then AV asked the next one, but it's okay. Gotcha. Chris, kudos on the question. Great question. I think they should target the best cornerback available. If that means a great slot, I'm okay with that because slot today, slot corner, nickel corner is becoming a really big deal. And especially if it's like a nickel corner, like, you know, the Cooper DeGene type who can play like inside. And I don't know if he's definitely going to play nickel at the NFL level. He might be able to play outside. I'm not sure. I'm not saying that's play safety. Strategy. he might play safety, but if you have him as your nickel, he's going to help you in the run game. He's going to blitz. He's going to do things like that. So if you can get somebody like that, a playmaker type, a star type, then I like that a lot, um, and that might be considered a safety these days. It's hard. The you know the lines are blurred. Um, so I don't – it's a D-back. I'm, I'm looking for the best defensive back I can get. Same here, and I just want one that is intelligent, one that is smart, one that understands how to dictate coverage or how to react to the routes that are in front of him and know his coverage assignments and his coverage rules based on what Shane Bowen is tasking him to do from a pattern match standpoint, right? I don't yep. want another DeAndre Baker out there who had no idea how to read that and ends up getting burnt and was kind of a suboptimal athlete to begin with. So AV hustles question is, is similar to the one we answered before about neighbors versus Dunes. So we'll move past that. And Vladimir, mostly Vladimir CEO baseball dad asks, what percentage of chances are we giving Marvin Harrison Jr. Full in a six? All the buzz has been quarterbacks and trades at three or even quarterbacks one through four. And we've heard that chargers are open to Joe all. Bowers or maybe even neighbors over Marvin Harrison Jr. So is there actually a chance the Giants get him at six? There is actually a chance. Now, if we have to put our percentage at it, that's where it gets interesting. I mm -hmm. think I'm going to roll with a 20% chance. So it's not likely, but it can realistically happen. One in five. That's pretty good. I'll go. Ooh, you know what, though? Like, I'm guaranteeing quarterbacks one through three. So let me just take those picks off the board. So we're at pick four to start the draft. Someone at that point would. It really just comes down to the the Cardinals. Cardinals. I mean, the, yeah. the Chargers no, could go. I'm not yep. sold on the Chargers not going with him as yeah, much as everybody same else. Here. That's yeah. why I'm one five. You know. Okay, I'm gonna go ten percent. I'm gonna go one in one in one in ten. All right, nice. All right, Matt Dubois. How you doing, Matt? Or there's this Peter actually. Peter this the Peter, beast. I believe. Yes. The way this is formatted it confuses. Not me. great. I agree. Peter the Beast three. How much film work do you conduct when deciding what pizzeria you go to? <laughs> good one, Peter. No film needed for the pizzeria. It's all taste test and it's all word of mouth. Um, you know, right lately I've been going a lot to Caniglio's, the place I've gone to with Nick, just because my dad is like a diehard feet. I brought it for him like the first time, like maybe a year ago, and he's in love with this pizza place. It's like his perfect kind of pizza. So I just like to surprise them, try to bring over a pizza pie when I'm going over to see my parents. So I know he'll always be happy. So and I don't really the problem is I talk a big game. Some people don't know that I talk a big game, but I don't really eat as much pizza as as my game suggests. I mm -hmm. love pizza. It's just not a big part of my daily diet, and I don't have too many nights. I'm just going out getting pizza, so I don't eat that much. I don't order that much pizza, I should say. So 
that's the that's the nitty gritty truth of it. But no film work needed, Peter. I've built up a nice arsenal. I know my team. I know my talent. I know where the good pizza is. I know my style of pizza. Like I know my 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 perfect fit for my system. My perfect fit for my system is coal fire thin crust. And if you can't find coal fire, just get me thin crust with a nice undercarriage and a crisp on it. No thick crust. Don't need any of that. No chewy. Don't need a, you know all the the nonsense on it. Just I know I know my I know what fits my system. Nick, how about you? For me, I don't really eat pizza all that often, but I do yeah. like being eclectic. I like trying different types of pizza. Like I like to change it up. I don't want the opposing pizza coordinator to understand or know where I'm going to go and what type of pizza I'm going to get. Now, I'm not going to get like anchovies or anything weird on the pizza, but I might throw a buffalo chicken or a barbecue chicken pizza out there. I don't know how some people feel about that. I think it's pretty damn good. And I don't do the pineapple pizza thing, but I'm also of the mindset that Go ahead, put some pineapple on your pizza if you want to be weird. I have no problem with that. <laughs> Matt Dubois asks, do you think Joe Shane would have traded pick number 39 overall for Brian Burns if he didn't also have 47 from the Leonard Williams trade? Also, question. do you guys plan on doing the mocking, the uh, grading the fan submitted mocks again this year? Grading the fan submitted mocks. That's something that we should do. Yeah, we haven't we really entertained that. But uh, now that we already have this mailbag, it might be a little bit difficult. But if anybody wants to comment we might be able to wrap up episodes with it. So if you guys yeah. want, go on over to our iTunes and leave your fan mock draft there. And Dan and I will check the you know, iTunes reviews and then we'll do it at the end of the episodes that we're recording, whether okay. it be the Drake May breakdown or what, what have you. So we'll do that from here on out. Matt, thank you so much for bringing that up. And as to your question, do we only think- Only five-star reviews will be-, will be we'll Of course, there. only five-star reviews. You could say we suck. I don't care. Just leave the five-star. <laughs> Do you think Joe Shane would have traded pick 39 for Brian Burns? You know what, man? I I don't know if he would have. I really don't. I think that that trade for the Leonard Williams trade, we applauded it at the time. We were like, that is an excellent move. But it really was a freaking excellent move. You got rid of this huge contract in a contract year to a team that was desperate to make the playoffs who needed an interior defensive lineman to help stop the San Francisco 49ers. And ultimately, that ended up failing. But he's staying there in Seattle. And now you have their second round pick. What a home run. And I don't know if they do that trade. I really don't. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I just Joe Shane has been really aggressive his entire tenure. I, feel I know, like man. I think I feel like we should applaud him for that. Yes. And part of that makes me think that there's a better chance than people realize that they're trading up to number three for a quarterback, assuming the Patriots don't have their guy land to them. So I think there's a better like you asked me before what the chance of Marvin Harrison. I said one of 10, 10 percent. I'm putting trade at like 35 percent, maybe 40 percent for the Giants. I'm 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 leaning in that direction, especially if Jane Daniels nice, goes too. Yeah, yeah. I, I now it's again depends a lot on the Patriots, but if Daniels goes to I'm putting if Daniels if if May goes to I'm dropping trade percentage to 10 percent or lower. If Daniels goes to I'm popping it back up to 35 to 40 percent for the Giants. To me personally, I believe May is their guy. Now, would they do that? So my point, my, the whole reason I said that, Nick, was to say the point of this. I think no matter what Shane was making that trade for Brian Burns, I think Shane's an aggressive GM who looks at it like I'm not going to be able to get a 25 year old talented edge like this anytime soon. And I may not, I'm certainly not getting him at 39 overall. And I have the cap space to play with because I'm about to clear out a bunch of cap space with the Daniel Jones thing next year. And yeah, cap was a concern before that. Cause I just extended Andrew Thomas and I signed Okarake and I extended Dexter Lawrence, but guess what? It's only a concern if Daniel Jones is on the books. If Daniel Jones is not on the books, I don't have to worry as much about the cap. So I think he kind of looked at it like that. Um, so I do kind of think he would have done that. Um, as far as the fan mocks go, by the way, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that. I think what Nick said, if you put it in the iTunes review, we'll read that, but we might also try to do an episode or some kind of content on it. Evan Brown asks in a scenario where the giants were able to choose between JJ McCarthy and Jane Daniels at six, who would you rather have them pick? JJ is a younger prospect room to grow and he targets the middle of the field. Yeah. We actually talked about this on a previous podcast, Evan, and both Dan and I said, Jaden Daniels with the acknowledgement that we're kind of a little bit, a little bit uh, hesitant because of yeah. the red flags, but the upside and the fact that we believe Brian Dable would be able to maximize that talent and tell the kid to get the hell down when he's rushing. Yeah, it's it's a gut feel, uh, you know, on paper, we easily take Jaden, but it's a gut feel and it feels a little queasy, but I still think we got to go Jaden. The second part of your question, Adam Rinaldi was, I can't see the Giants not selecting quarterback sometime during the draft. Developing a quarterback alternative for 2025 is pivotal. And Mara saying what he what he had to alludes to him possibly admitting defeat on Daniel Jones. What are your thoughts on that? 
can't see the Giants not selecting a quarterback sometime during. Yeah, that's. I mean, Dan and I have been saying this since the beginning of the the off season. Like we think, like yo, you pick in that six, you're gonna try at least if you like the quarterback to go quarterback. I still think, like Dan said, thirty five percent chance. I think that's a good ballpark. But I also think they're content if the Patriots are trying to strong arm them, selecting Roma right. Dunze. It really just depends on how they feel about JJ McCarthy, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels. If Jaden Daniels is even available to them, but I they they're exploring and exhausting all the options. Like one thing they're not doing is being like, well, we have Daniel Jones on the roster. We're good. Like, that's not what they're doing, right? Like, if they do not love these prospects, I don't think they're going to draft over Daniel Jones just to draft over him. It really depends on how they feel about the individual kid. Right. But that that the thing that's interesting to me, Nick, about that, I agree with you 100% on that. But as far as this question, like, taking a quarterback at some point during the draft. So now we're like round two, round three, yeah. we're talking, you know, maybe round four. <laughs> I go back and forth on this. Like, you know, I started the offseason. Like, if they don't take one in round one, I at least want to see one in round two or three just to give me hope. And just because uh, Dave has shown some stuff with DeVito, blah, blah, blah. I still kind of feel that way, Nick. But then part of me also feels like eh, when you go outside of the top five or six at quarterback or whatever it is, uh, do I even really want to do this? Like, what's the point? Is there really even any true upside to a quarterback we're going to get in round two or three? Like, what's the ceiling? Is there a ceiling? When is it ha like, so I don't know as much and what am I giving up? Right. I might be giving up a good positional player there who could help at least, you know, either start or play a, play a role. So I don't know anymore if I feel as strong as I do on that. Yeah. It's a, uh, it depends again on how they feel. Like if they love Michael Penix yeah. Jr. It's, it's going to mean more than, than what you right. and I feel right. Oh yeah. They think that that's their guy. And then Adam yeah. also asks, I am of the opinion that Dable is adaptable and many of the quarterbacks could work, but is there one that fits best? I think opportunity cost is relevant and non first round quarterback success is negligible, but Penix late first, early second seems like a match in so many ways. Yeah. I don't see it the same way you see it, Adam. Um, I think the best fit for Dable by far is Drake may given his skill set and his upside and how it could project to the NFL. I think the second best set would be Jaden Daniels. I don't necessarily – I know there's so supposed to be a fit with Penix, but Penix's fit to me depends entirely on if Penix is able to be an effective NFL quarterback. And projection-wise, I have my concerns there. Um, so if he's not effective as an NFL quarterback, it doesn't matter what his style is or how that style fits Brian Dable and what Brian Dable does best. He needs to be better under pressure, in my opinion, and he needs to show some ability to run – to process NFL defenses and, and NFL offenses, not, and, and, and sorry, understand and operate NFL offense, not just, I mean, he could definitely be able to do that, by the way, I'm not like down on Penix because I think it's impossible for him to do these things. It's just that I haven't seen it. And I don't know if I feel that comfortable projecting it. Market Mike X asks, Hey Dan, hypothetical draft question. One, Caleb, two, May, three, Daniels, trade back with Minnesota for 11 and 23, end up with Penix plus something, or stay put with Rome and neighbors. Yeah, look, if it's if it's up to me and I'm taking and my options are either trade with Minnesota for 11, 23, maybe next year's first, but maybe next year's second. Let's say it was just if we didn't get the best deal out of that, because, you know, Minnesota's like, ah, we're going to do it for for three or but we're not, for, for six, we give up less. And say it's just, you know, one or 11, 23 and next year's two or three, whatever. If that ends up being we take Penix at 11, then something I'm definitely staying put and taking Rome neighbors. Romer neighbors. I do not want Penix at 11. And then I get it. Oh, great. I get 23rd pick, but I, I've used the 11th on Michael Penix. That that's not for me. I'm right there with you. And then we have a question too. He says more likely to happen. This is from market Mike X as well. Giants trading up to get may or Daniels uh -huh. or Nick swimming in a river. And I don't, well, understand this. I already gave a 35% chance. I think the giants could trade up for Drake may. And I think there's gotta be a less than 1% chance that Nick's ever stepping foot in another river. Uh, oh, what do you mean? I swim in rivers all the time, man. Remember that I river do. story you gave on the podcast a few years ago. I know, but I'll still go that dude. Of course. Yeah. People pee in river. It's disgusting. I think, I think it's deplorable what people do with their, with their bowel movements in rivers, but I still, oh, like I forgot it. you're, you were against. It reminds me you're against people in the ocean right yeah i think it's gross oh, you're not a freaking anyway bad all the, oh, no 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 all what the freaking day. ridiculous people who sit there and they go well whales do it you're not a whale you're a human being you're a superior Every creature you don't pee in the freaking ocean you pee in the gross. ocean other people you other humans are swimming there it's disgusting yeah, you pee in the ocean let me tell you something i i don't care what you know people are going to comment on this and they're going to say oh dan so disgusting and nick's the bastard you're right i would never pee in the ocean and i gotta tell you i guarantee Nick, them there's I gonna be more trust... comments supporting you 
then they're going to be supporting. I them. hope so. I think there are my... more people who are disgusting and they pee in the ocean rather than people who will have respect for others and go and walk a little no, distance. No, to go sometimes pee in a it's a long shit. walk. That's the problem. That's the mm. part that you never acknowledge. Got legs, sometimes man. This is a long walk. There, you go, for example, if I'm at like Belmar or something like that, some of those beaches, you bet you back out of the, you walk out of the ocean. Oh, I got to pee. It's so bad. You walk, you know, you're drinking, you're having fun with your friends. You've had three or four cocktails at that point, some beers. You don't, you, you got to pee. You can't hold it in at this point. Now you walk out of the ocean, you look toward your, where your, where your tent, uh, you know, not your tent. You look toward where your beach towel is. And then you look up to the boardwalk and you're like, oh my God, there's no bathroom on my end of the boardwalk. Holy crap. I got to walk like four or five freaking things down. I'm not going to make it in time. I guess I'm just going in the ocean. And that's the thought process. And I can't blame anyone for that. But my point I was trying to make, Nick, earlier was that there may be people in the comments defending you and coming against me. But I am positive that over 50% of the people who are doing that do pee in the ocean and they're not claiming it. Because it's very easy online to claim that you don't pee in the ocean. Oh, this is disgusting. He does it. I'm at least owning up to it. I do pee in the ocean. And I respect everyone who does. And I do not expect people who are having fun, drinking with their friends, had a lot of beverages, just be walking a mile and a half to go pee. I wish this was always sunny, where when everybody peed in the pool, it, it uh, just released this blue dye that everyone yeah. could see that it was you peeing in the pool. Let and me then you were shamed. Like it was Game of Thrones. You get shamed for it because that is a shameful act. Sure. Let me make one thing clear. I do not condone and I have not peed in pools. I will not pee in a pool. That is a very end of hot tubs. Those are two places you do not pee. A wide open ocean with salt water, you can pee in a wide open ocean. There's no pipes there, though, bro. It gets washed into the sink. It's not a big problem. The salt, <laughs> will, the, the salt will do some stuff to it. All right. That's <laughs> science right there. Okay. David Wainwright asks, why do you think it's that the Giants have not had? Why do you think it? It is that the Giants have not had a functional screen pass game for what seems like an eternity. I get jealous when I see other teams running screens effectively. What are the critical elements of these plays and what are the Giants missing? Good question. I think a lot of it is timing. First off, I think the Giants have been out of sync because their offensive line has been bad because they have had a lack of continuity on the offensive line. I don't think they disguise it well. So that comes from the offensive line. I think Saquon wasn't terrible at disguising the screen. If I'm going to be honest, I don't think a lot of it was on Saquon Barkley. But I also believe a lot of this has to do with the fact that the Giants, everything that they kind of run is between the sticks and five yards. They're not a team that really threatens opposing defenses down the field all too often. So a lot of teams are driving down already and there are telltale signs. Anytime you watch a play, you can see the offensive lineman. Oh, I'm blocking you. I'm blocking. And then they just fade off. Like they're not actually, it does look different. And I don't feel like the giants have, uh, have really disguised their attentions when they were running these screens too well. Like how many successful screens have we had since we've covered this podcast, Dan? Uh, Jeez, man, like a handful. I was thinking about the Barkley one against the Eagles on like Thursday night football. And I remember that was from 2018 and it was before you came on the podcast. It's like, they know that's, that's like 65 yarder against the Eagles in one of the night games. And it was a Thursday night game. That was a six screen, but that, that was the one that one. we lost in overtime. Eli Manning was a starter so. and Carson yes. Wentz came back and beat us on Thursday. Yes. Oh my God. I remember the dry back from my parents' house after that game. I was like, we, we were never, that was in Philadelphia. So we're never going to beat that yeah. team. We're just never. It oh, was in Philadelphia. So frustrating. That yeah. was definitely a very successful screen. I can't, you know, not that many come to mind. It's, it's, it's really insane. I think you nailed the crux of it, Nick. It's a, it's a problem with not just the offensive line play, but also just the lack of continuity of the offensive line. You want to have a good, see a good screen game. Look for a team that has continuity on the offensive line. Look for a team that practice. The second part for me is yes, it's the offensive line mostly, but it's also, I just don't think it's a big part of what Dable does and a part of, big part of their DNA and their makeup. And they're not, it's not, it sounds stupid to say, but I just don't think they're practicing it enough, quite frankly. And it's, there's only so much time to do what you're doing. And honestly, man, there are times where the Giants call the screen at such a time. And this is even back when Jason Garrett was the coach. It was like yeah. such a well-designed and well-called play. Know. And then all that had to happen was like two blockers in space block one stupid like 170-pound cornerback. And somehow the cornerback was able to evade them and tackle Saquon. And you're just like, how? Like, what the hell? It just seemed like they were cursed. It was crazy. I know. All right, Nick, we already went over the hour I allotted us for these podcast mailbags. Try to keep it more content. I know people say you got to keep hours uh, podcast under an hour. And I understand because when I listen to long podcasts, I feel the same way. We did not get to every question, though. There's still it looks like five and a half pages of questions left. So we'll do another one of these at some point. You will get your questions answered at some point. Don't worry. But we're going to end today on what could be a fun one. And I, it is always fun when it comes in with a question that has a little nod to bashing my boy one of the Giants' greatest, and by greatest, I mean one of the most detrimental people in the last decade to the New York football Giants, and you know who it is. You know that music. 
you know that music. It's it's from Tommy, and he asks, what would be your personal worst-case Giants draft? First three rounds, give me your worst case. Imagine mm. you are channeling your inner Dave Gettleman. <laughs> well, in that case, one of those picks would end up being a running back, and I don't think there's a top oh, yeah. running back available for it to be at six, so it would be a running back in the second round, I think, would be one of my, one of my choices to this. And then – is there a big space eating defensive lineman that could be picked at six? Probably not. So maybe like an edge rusher that he fell in love with for, for some reason. And then in the third round, a linebacker, which I don't really think he would do. Like, it's just like the positions that I don't really put a high priority on being selected in the first three rounds when there are other positions and players at those positions that fit with the giants need that are overlooked to fill the need that Dave Gettleman in this scenario felt necessary. No, you didn't go deep. You didn't dig deep enough, Nick, because you get you have a lot of creativity when you're talking what Dave Gettleman can do, what he's capable of. So here's my worst day draft scenario on the Dave Gettleman timeline. So here we go. We remember one thing about Dave's drafts. He said multiple times after almost every draft pick, I tried trading up for Will Hernandez. I almost traded up for him. I didn't do it, right? He traded up for DeAndre Banks. He tried trading up apparently for uh, Josh Allen, the edge rusher Big after area. Daniel Jones. That's something that Art Stapleton really important. He tried trading up for Devin Bush, the linebacker, didn't get it done. Made a few trade-ups like I talked about, DeAndre Banks and a few others. So there will be a trade-up. Oh, yeah. Dave Gettleman is the type of GM who has hubris. When he likes a player, he's like, I know this better than anyone else. My evaluation is the best. I got this guy ranked eighth on my board. We've got a trade-up. That's how you do it. So we start with six. Pick six. He went to the senior bull, Nick, and he fell in full bloom love with Bo Nix. Bo Nix commanded a huddle really well. Oh, Bo Nix yeah. started a lot of games. Bo Nix has won a lot of games. He doesn't care where the projected mocks say Nix is going. And he's heard whispers around the NFL that if he doesn't take Nix at six, Nix is going to go. It's not, he can't get Nick's at 17. Okay. You idiot. He, cannot get, he can't get Bo Nick's at 17. He's hurt. He knows. He knows. Okay. He can't take the risk. Bo Nick's might not be on the board at 17. He knows he has two first round backs. In this case, he doesn't. But he's thinking, you know, maybe I can trade back into one to get Bo Nick's. I can't take that risk. So it's Bo Nick's at six. And then we lose our third round pick because we use our third round pick and a future pick to trade up from our pick in 47 in round two all the way to the top of round two, and we take Trey Benson at round two, the running back. Because remember, <laughs> we brought him in for visits. We love Trey Benson. He's the guy who could revamp the room. He's the next Saquon Barkley. Not quite touched by the hand of God like Barkley, but maybe touched by the hand of, you know, like my, uh, you know, who would be next to God? It's not Jesus, something lower than that. Like, I don't know Bible. I don't know Bible. It can't be as good as Jesus. Jeez, man. It can't be as good as Jesus. If you're touched by the hand of God. You can't, I can't go to Jesus. Just, like, just Trey say a disciple. How about that? Okay, a disciple. Yeah, an angel, a fallen angel. He's touched by a falling. Because look, I can't be saying that Barkley is touched by the hand of God while somebody that's Trey Benson. It's not, it's not fair enough to Barkley to say Trey Benson is touched by Jesus. So, all right, he's touched by a disciple, a fallen angel. So now he gets Benson and Bo Nix. Those are our picks. We don't have a third round pick. And we've lost last year's uh, next year's third as well. Plus, we come back in the supplemental draft because he remembers the Sam Beal supplemental pick. You remember that one? And he says, uh, who's a good supplemental pick for this year? So I, I don't know any but guys. But yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's it. That's the Dave Draffer. That's the worst case scenario. Bo Nix. We get Bo Nix, Trey Benson, and we don't have a third round pick. I love how you said the disciples were fallen angels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about religion. So it's not my board today here. All right. On that note, we will call it a night. We know we didn't get to your questions again, five, five and a half more pages. We will get them um, potentially a little bit of a break. because we want to get some other content, Drake may profile among other things, but thank you again so much for tuning in more content coming profiles, film breakdowns. We're going to have, we have some more interviews lined up, which I'm excited about as well. So stay tuned, keep it locked and loaded and have a great rest of your weekend.